Good morning, Sylvia. It's day eight of our adventure. It's Saturday. We are in Twin Falls, Idaho. Tonight we'll be in Boise, Idaho. It's 45 degrees, about 3,600 feet in elevation. Seven o'clock. And today is the day I've been looking forward to. The Oregon California Trail Association, the Idaho chapter, is leading a guided tour of the Oregon Trail in central Idaho today. So I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Let's get on the road. Holy cow, it's windy. This little stub of a concrete post over here is where the Oregon Trail goes. <laughs> it's going out this way. Over here, 75 yards out, you can see a white carcinite marker. This is a great tour led by Jerry from the Idaho chapter of the Oregon California Trail Association. I planned for this video to be mostly his presentation, but I failed to account for the wind. I will narrate a little and try to pull out snippets of his voice from the wind to give you the basics of the tour. We start where the trail crosses a public highway and we listen to a local rancher talk about the trail on her property and her love and care for the history. The Oregon Trail came from Glens Ferry up through Betty Ann's rancher. This is Betty Ann Elton. She and her husband Nick live just over here. And it became the deadliest route in Idaho. Okay, they got into bad water. Every campsite became a graveyard. We have found about 45 to 50 graves. When you say they got into some bad water, do you mean so they died from like dysentery or something? Or, or we don't know. We don't they know. The bodies, but what, what when do you're mean? on the Oregon Trail and you come to water and it makes you sick from either E. coli or Giardia whatever it is. You dehydrate and you die. So the cadaver dogs will identify human remains. God, okay. And they will go to the strongest point of human remains. Because the Oregon Trail is right over here. You're going to see it's a depression in the ground. It's called a swell. As the wagons roll along, their wheels kicked up dust. It's often windy. It's Idaho, right? <laughs> myself a diary researcher. So I have 2,700 accounts of people that traveled across Idaho. And when you take those accounts and you compile them by location, you get some really interesting stories. There are some good swales along this creek. There's a rock where the wagons ground off a part of the rock and they just bounced over it. This area had hot and cold springs. The immigrants in their diaries talked about cooking meat in the hot springs. These springs are dry now because of irrigation wells in the area. Oh, 
post up there. So there's a lot of diary accounts. They came down to the hot springs. So there were several springs. <laughs> These are called Teapot Dome Hot Springs. Okay, this is the Oregon Trail. But it's since been disturbed, destroyed by people driving on it. So we're having lunch at a winery. Wow. Poor Sylvia. She's been on too many dirt roads. We're still at the winery. These people were very nice. Five bucks got us uh, hot dogs and hamburgers and a bunch of sides and a glass of wine. So I don't drink and dry it. I just had the one glass, but doesn't mean I didn't get a bottle for later and put in the cooler. <laughs> So over here, you'll see an Oregon Trail mark. So what we're going to do at this point is very carefully, you're going to walk out to the Oregon Trail behind me here. And there's some graves out there. I want you to find those graves. Now, Caleb, where's Caleb? I'm right here. You have a question. I know you have a question. <laughs> oh, Caleb. <laughs> Ask the question here. What does an Oregon Trail grave look like? Great question, Caleb. So, in Idaho, most of your trail graves are simply a pile of rocks. It's not going to be three feet high. It might be two rocks high, it might be one. But you're going to see this pile or cluster of rocks. Now, what's unusual about this site is a couple of things. Number one, Maria Belshaw in 1853 mentions passing five graves between Rattlesnake and Canyon Creek. Number two, it's in the middle of nowhere. Graves are normally at camping sites on the creeks. Typically, if someone dies, they die overnight, you bury them, you move on. Why these five graves are here in the middle of nowhere, I don't know. Okay. I suspect that these are people that died from the North Alternate. Remember the North Alternate had the bad water? We had lots and lots of graves. The Death March. This is the end of the graves. Okay, this is the end of the diary accounts that talk about multiple graves at camping sites. So I think this is the last of the North Alternate victims. Rattlesnake had 12. There's diary accounts that talk about, we came to Grave Creek, there's 10 graves. And he says, we have to add one more to the 10 as Mrs., I can't remember her name, her daughter dies, we bury her and move on at two o'clock. Okay, and then two years later, Sarah Sutton comes along and says, here lies the grave of Mary Ellen Orchard, age eight months, who they had buried two years prior. That's one of the few connected graves between diaries that we have in Idaho. Oh, wow. So. We're looking at graves right beside the trail right now. And I'll show you a close-up in a moment when the people move out of the way. I only show this to you because I trust you all as my friends now. We do not mark these. We don't put up a fence around them and say, hey, look here, Oregon Trail graves, because somebody will come out and vandalize them. These are sacred. These are burials. Okay, this is a grave that's been confirmed by a cadaver dog.
Canyon Creek was a popular camping spot on the trail. The stage station was built in 1874 by the Archibald Daniel family. The station offered crucial supplies and services for the Oregon Trail travelers until 1884 when the Oregon Short Line Railroad was built. Jerry played a large role in getting this building restored and preserved. This. We hired a historic architect to rebuild this. It is, I will open the gate in a minute. It is beautiful. They did a fantastic job. We need to get windows and a door in it. The problem is, correct me if I'm wrong here, BLM has red tape. They have to have three bids for anything that they buy. They can only find one company that can make historically correct windows for this building. <laughs> so they can't get windows. My last name is Daniel. Look what I see. Archibald and Harriet Daniel. Hmm. There's an Archibald. Okay, gather round. It's story time again. <laughs> Jerry has strong evidence that a massacre happened here. But because this was a little used trail and no one survived, there are no written records of what happened here. Listen to him describe the reasons he believes the massacre happened right here. I've also worked with this guy for 20 years and have a great relationship, have access anytime I want. The Oregon Trail crossed this ridge behind and they kind of followed these power lines down. They followed them up this draw, basically underneath the power lines here. Hmm. Now the Jeffries route, or Jeffries Goodell cutoff, for your preference, that was started in 1854, then crossed over the Danskin Mountains here and dropped down Ditto Creek. Now, I have diary accounts from 1862 when Tim Goodell came on that route, and when they got to the junction of the Oregon Trail, which is right here where the power lines are, they found a massacred wagon train. They found skeletons, human and animals, in the long grass, they found a bunch of wagons that had been burned, okay? Several people from 1862 talked about seeing these skeletons, as did people in 1863 and 1864. Well, the Jeffries route was used in 1854. There was an attack by Indians up by Little Camas. The next day there was the Ward Massacre. I believe that this massacre these people saw in 62 was the third attack of 1854. I believe it was the last wagon train of the year. It was in this draw behind me. Once they killed all the people at the Ward Massacre, they skedaddled, okay? Their camp was gone. They packed up and they moved. I believe that they left. They followed their normal trail back up to the Camas Prairie, came upon a wagon train here, and said, what the heck, we're already in trouble? <laughs> Let's just wipe out this wagon train as well. Now, both of those attacks in 54 had two white men identified as leading the attacks. Okay, that was a common thing. White men were leading these attacks, instigating the Indians to attack the wagon trains. Now, there's a great deal of discussion. A lot of people believe it was Mormons in many cases because they were trying to drive the settlers away because they didn't want anybody else to be in their area. Other people believe it was, shall we say, some lazy or rogue trappers. The fur trapping industry had died. They were looking for money, so they would attack the wagon trains. And again, you can read those articles on the website. I think they're pretty darn good. Maybe they should be. They won me an award, but uh, that's beside the point. Oh, I think I hurt myself. <laughs> right over here, at the base of this little hill, there's a farm road. Beside that farm road going up the hill, you'll see ruts of the Jeffries route. Hmm. There's actually a double swell there. Those rocks that you see behind me here, up on the ridge, I found round rifle balls at the base of those rocks. Hmm. So you can imagine the Indians attacking from those rocks, the immigrants firing in 1854, it would have been black powder, ramrod type rifles, firing towards the Indians in those rocks. 
couple of them are flattened out, one of them is still round, so he must not have been a very good shot. But you can also let your imagination run and figure that whoever fired that, it may have been the last thing that they did. Because there were no survivors, there's no record of the attack itself. Well, you took different routes because the main route, the grass was eaten off of the main route for a half mile and on either side at each of the creeks. So you might travel 15 miles a day, but then you had to travel half mile to a mile and then back to get back on the road the next day. So the grass was used up. The camping areas might be full. A lot of it was due to Indian problems. Okay, There were a lot of Indian problems along the Snake River, the Bannock Indians especially, and also the Shoshones. And so they took these other routes, like the Jeffreys route, to try and avoid the Indian problems, and then had three attacks. The North Alternate was started because some spurious fur traders said, go this route, you'll have better grass. Well, beyond Salmon Falls, it was about 35 miles without water. So it was a day and a half without water, and that scared a lot of people. So these trappers said, you can ferry here, you'll have better water, better grass. It was, but you also had a lot more deaths. How quickly did news travel back about these uh, experiences with the massacres back to the east coast where the troops were starting so that people could change their plans? Before the days of the telegraph. Yeah. So it had to be done basically by ship over the Isthmus of Panama and then back by ship to New York. Okay. So it so would take a while. Quick. You know, word of the Ward Massacre, for example, uh -huh. spread very quickly to Oregon. Ah. All the newspapers lit up with stories about the Ward Massacre and the mutilations and how horrible it was. There's nothing on this one because nobody knew about it. Gotcha. You know? There's stuff on the one about the little Camus attack because there were survivors. Mm -hmm. All appearances are that there were no survivors here. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got accounts that say it was a mile below Robert Sproat's place where the attack occurred. This ranch up here was Robert Sproat's place. So I believe that the attack was here. You know, it could easily be in this valley. I don't know where the bodies or the skeletons were moved to, and that's what the search is at this point. Did the dogs pick up hits around here? Oh, yeah. 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 The problem is, you had all these bodies that decomposed over the course of eight years. Then the bones were picked up sometime later. later. So the dogs hit on the VOCs from where the bodies had lain for a number of years. There's nothing there. But they picked it up all around here? Yeah. Yeah, they picked up last summer this little knoll 100 yards over here. They were hitting on top of that, so we scanned the top of that with ground penetrating radar. Further up the draw, uh, there's a big rock that stands up, and beyond that, there's a smaller rock. They went nuts at the base of that smaller rock up there. Well, that's a long way. If all your bodies are down in here, why would you move the bodies up to there? Okay. But somebody might have tried to escape and been shot there, or maybe an Indian died there or something. So what we're going to do now is walk over here to the farm road and follow it up. Notice the trail along the side as you're climbing the hill. On the west side of that pinnacle of rocks, there are immigrant names written in axle grease. Any time that there was a big rock beside the trail, it became essentially a post office. People wrote their name on it so that would tell their friends coming later that they made it this far. I think these are the wagon squales right here. Yeah, and I'm standing it right here. So our guide says that the Indians were probably up in these rocks and that the massacre happened down here. And the cadaver dogs if they had made hits. The tour was a lot of fun and everyone seemed to enjoy themselves. Now you have to be a history buff to enjoy this kind of thing and look for graves and ruts and swells, but I enjoyed it. And Jerry really knows his stuff. No one was able to stump him with a question. 
and he's been doing this for nearly 30 years and knows a lot about the Oregon Trail in Idaho. So if you ever get a chance to take the tour, I highly recommend it. And I will put links in the description of this video to the website so you can get information for yourself. Thanks for watching.